A single mother gets a crank call while at work. A month later, she disappears while in the parking lot of a university medical center. Cops find her car burning in an alley the next morning. Phones begin to ring with claims, threats, and confessions. But the mother remains unfound. Four years later, when her partial remains are found, there is little evidence left for authorities to work with. Bloggers, podcasters, documentarians, and TV shows theorize about the caller and the people around her. But how credible are some of these calls? And are there better suspects? Were obvious suspects overlooked by police, including a group of individuals who were on a four-month-long spree of kidnapping and sexual assault at the time? or the serial murderer active in the area at the time. Join us as we look at the mystery of Dorothy Jane Scott. Dorothy Scott was a single mother of a four-year-old son in May of 1980. Living in Stanton, she worked as a secretary for a couple of head shops in Anaheim, California. Head shops were the equivalent of a mix between a Spencer's gift and a smoke shop, selling mostly drug paraphernalia like pipes and bongs. On the evening of May 28, 1980, Dorothy attended a work event that ended around 9.30 p.m. At the event, Dorothy became aware of a co-worker named Conrad having a swollen hand from a presumed insect bite. As it looked infected, Dorothy and another co-worker, Pam, offered to take Conrad to the hospital to have the hand looked at. On the way to the University of Irvine Medical Center in the city of Orange, the three stopped briefly at Dorothy's parents' home in Anaheim. At the medical center, Dorothy and Pam waited in the lobby of the emergency room while a doctor examined Conrad's hand. Receiving a prescription for treatment, Conrad and Pam went to the medical center pharmacy while Dorothy went to the parking lot to retrieve her car. At about 11.30 p.m., Pam and Conrad exited the hospital to see Dorothy's car drive past them, turn onto the street with a small car in front of it. They couldn't see who was driving Dorothy's car. The two were puzzled, but assumed Dorothy would return shortly, so they waited. After two hours, they contacted university police at the hospital, but were assured there was probably nothing to worry about, so they made other arrangements to get home. In the morning, Dorothy's father, Jacob, would return to the medical center and file a missing persons report as Dorothy never returned. The police told Jacob's father not to contact the media as it would be better to keep a low profile so they would not have to deal with crank callers. At around 4 a.m. that same day, about 2.5 miles from the medical center, the Santa Ana Police Department found Dorothy's car ablaze in an alley near the intersection of Townsend and Monta Vista. Around a week after the disappearance, Dorothy's parents would receive a call from a man who would ask, Are you related to Dorothy Scott? Then say, I have her, before hanging up when they answered. After an additional week, Jacob, unsatisfied with police's progress, contacted the Orange County Register. On June 12th, a front page story appeared in the Register with the headline, Father Losing Hope, Daughter Will Be Found. The article outlined the facts of the investigation to that point, adding the FBI had been contacted but declined to get involved because of lack of evidence of a federal crime. The angle of the article was clearly that of the frustrated father with police and the call received by the parents, as it never suggested readers assist in the investigation in any way. No call for assistance, no law enforcement point of contact, not even a full-size picture or description of the person missing. The same day the article appeared in the register, an editor at the newspaper received a call from a man claiming to have killed Dorothy because she had cheated on him. He gave some details about what Dorothy was wearing and the reason for the visit to the hospital. UCI police quickly validated the information given to the editor, who wrote a follow-up story the next day. In this story, we learned for the first time that Dorothy had received 
a threatening call at her work about a month before the dis her disappearance. The second story prompted the Los Angeles Times to run a story on the call to the Register's editor, which outlined a few additional details of the case. Media reports regarding Dorothy seemed to disappear following this story. After four years, in 1984, human bones were found in a rural area off of Santa Ana Canyon Road in Anaheim Hills, California. The bones of a dog were also found with the remains. They were eventually identified as being Dorothy's remains from dental records and Dorothy's mother, Vera, identifying some jewelry found at the location. Authorities determined the scattered remains had been there at least two years, based on char marks found on the bones and the fact that a wildfire had passed through the area two years prior. The apparent kidnapping and murder of Dorothy Jane Scott remains unsolved to this day. Analysis. As we look at this case, there are some key facts most of the reporting of this case fails to see and simply overlooks in lieu of the sensational. While there is likely nothing any investigating agency could have done to save Dorothy from her fate, the fact that the state police assigned to UCI was the investigating agency was pivotal in the handling of this investigation. The individuals policing California universities were sworn officers who carried guns and had attended real police academies but they were clearly not experienced in handling complex investigations that reached beyond the walls of their campuses. But even more importantly, UCI police had little motive to engage in such investigations. Their world was protecting students and faculty, not investigating kidnappings of a local woman who was not even a patient at the medical center. Universities are not only institutions of higher learning, they are businesses. Businesses which have a brand to protect. Before government funded student loans, paying parents didn't send their children to universities riddled with crime. We spoke with a state police officer who worked on another university campus at the time of Dorothy's disappearance. He told us of an incident in the 1970s where a chief of police at another university was drummed out after telling a sexual assault victim to relax, it's over. Though we could not find media reports of that quote, in 1975, the chief of Cal State University Dominguez Hills was forced out after covering up a sexual assault of a professor on campus. In 1989, UCI police, still under the same chief, would experience the same type of controversy when the department delayed alerting people to a sexual assault that occurred on campus. The police waited two and a half days before alerting faculty and students. In the 1989 Register article, the chief is quoted as saying, Based on the limited amount of information we have, an arrest is unlikely. On June 14, 1980, the Los Angeles Times article on Dorothy's disappearance, the chief is quoted as saying, They, the Scots, are probably reaching that point we have reached, that we probably won't find her a lot. There is always a glimmer of hope, but it isn't very bright. Contrast these facts with the UCI police telling Jacob Scott not to go to the media, and a clear picture begins to form about the motives and efforts of UCI police. In 1992, this chief would come under fire for his ability to lead his officers and be shifted to a newly created position called Emergency Preparedness Director. It would appear his political skills saved him his job, but his competency lost him the position. Scott's father is quoted as saying, they told me to keep quiet, that they wanted to keep a low profile, or else they would get a lot of crank phone calls they would have to follow up on. A woman is missing, her car is found burning within six hours of last being seen, and instead of asking the public for help finding her, they decide to do the self-serving thing of maintaining a low profile. While it is extremely unlikely that going to the media the next day would have saved Dorothy's life, it could have produced witnesses. Someone who saw her car 
saw Dorothy, saw someone in the UCI parking lot, or saw someone buying a can of gas to torch a car. The saddest part is the Los Angeles Times article indicated an FBI spokesman stated that they discussed the case with the UCI police, but declined to get involved because of lack of evidence of a crime. Apparently, a strange disappearance and burning car doesn't rise to that level. Everyone seemed to be punting their responsibilities when it came to finding Dorothy. Regarding the calls that Dorothy received prior to her disappearance, the first media report made no no reference of it. The second media report at the time referenced only one crank call a few weeks before her disappearance. Looking at the three major media reports at the time of Dorothy's disappearance, the first article was about the father being frustrated with police's progress of the investigation into the disappearance of his daughter. This call cites the I have her call received by the family. The second article was the anonymous call to the editor, which referenced a single crank call to Dorothy's work a few weeks prior to her disappearance. The third article, which was the Los Angeles Angeles Times article on the subject made no reference to calls prior to her disappearance. The point of these observations is that if Dorothy was being stalked prior to her disappearance, it was not something that her family was aware of at the time of these reports, and the co-worker that referenced a call prior to her disappearance indicated that it was one call. Of these calls, one of them distinctly stands out from the others, and based on its timing, different motives can be inferred for it. The I Have Her call, received by Dorothy's parents before the first media report, stands out from the other calls. It implied that she had disappeared because of a kidnapping but didn't try to capitalize on it. Based on the fact that the FBI declined to get involved in the investigation, we would guess that this call was done by someone wanting to stimulate action in the investigation. As it is most likely, Dorothy was already deceased by the time of this call. It is unlikely that the perpetrator was the one who made this call. As has already been demonstrated, there is questionable evidence that Dorothy received more than one crank call prior to her disappearance. However, the one call does open the possibility that there was some creep associated with the head shops who liked making crank calls. However, it does not make the case that Dorothy was being stalked. Although, there are some reports that Dorothy received a dead rose on her car prior to her disappearance, there is no evidence this is anything more than a fabrication. It is not mentioned in the media reports at the time of her disappearance or at the time her remains were found and identified. It is, however, mentioned in a TV guide description of a soap opera episode listing around that time. The call to the editor at the register also does not provide any details that would suggest Dorothy was being stalked. While UCI police validated some of the facts the caller gave, he also got some things wrong. Dorothy never had the opportunity to call anyone from the hospital as the caller stated. Her co-worker Pam was with her the entire time and stated she did not make any calls. Two weeks after her disappearance, the color of the scarf she was wearing could have been widely discussed among the co-workers and customers of the head shops. And it would have been easy for people associated with the head shop to have known why Conrad's hand was infected. So, there is a crank caller somehow associated with the head shops, and he is able to give some trivial facts about the case, but fabricates a motive and opportunity. The most curious thing about the anonymous calls is no recording of the caller's voice was ever captured. It is very possible that the calls after the media report to the editor and the Scott family were the killer, but it is far more likely this was a perverted crank caller who was spurred on by the media reports. The location of Scott's burnout car was the only other piece of evidence at the time of her disappearance, dumped about two and a half miles south of UCI Medical Center and a 20-minute drive from the location where Dorothy's remains were found, it was left in 
in an alley between an apartment complex and a drainage ditch, with an elementary school on the other side. Though at that time, the worst part of Orange County would be considered better than the best part of some cities. This neighborhood could only be described as one of the rougher ones. Based on the location's distance from the freeway, it can be concluded that the perpetrator was likely associated in some way with this neighborhood. This is where the real investigation should have occurred. Suspects and theories. Starting with general suspects, our first thought, having personal knowledge of what the area was like in the 1980s, was a transient off the railroad tracks at the rear of the hospital. We then thought of the fact that the Orange County Animal Control Service is one block south of the hospital. Perhaps an animal control officer like Dennis Rader, who is known as the BTK killer, or another employee. However, in terms of general suspects, there are two which would be the most suspect. The first being a staff member or student of UCI. Hospitals run like little cities. They have meal preparation, laundry services, housekeeping services, and facilities maintenance services, as well as doctors, nurses, technicians, and security. They are additionally a 24-hour-a-day operation and a three-shift operation. The changeover from second or swing shift to third or graveyard shift is usually 11 p.m. Being that Dorothy was abducted at about 11.30 p.m., this would mean that there was potentially staff members in the parking lot when Dorothy went to retrieve her car. One has to wonder if any of the dishwashers in the cafeteria live near Townsend and Monta Vista, the intersection near where Dorothy's car was found, and whether the UCI police even bothered to check. An interesting find in relation to this possibility was a media report from 1988 where an animal rights group claimed to have stolen 13 beagles from a UCI lab. The dogs had been used for experiments over the years since 1975. The report featured a picture of the UCI police chief standing looking at an empty cage. Again, one has to wonder if one of these dogs were the remains found with Dorothy. The second general suspect would be the patients and visitors to the medical center hospital. A hospital is a unifying part of a community, a place where people from both sides of the track go. Could someone sitting in a waiting room with Dorothy and Pam have followed Dorothy to the parking lot? Was it possible that a 17-year-old victim of leprosy was at the hospital that night? On April 20th, 1980, about a month before Dorothy's disappearance, a 14-year-old girl was dropped off near her church in Costa Mesa. After her parents drove off, two men approached her asking her directions. She became nervous at their behavior and attempted to run, but they easily caught her and forced her into a small car where two other men were waiting. Held in the car at knife and gunpoint, this would be the start of a traumatic and horrifying night for the young girl that would end four hours later when the men would drop her off near the South Coast Plaza. After kidnapping her and sexually assaulting her for hours, they would leave her with the sick admonishment that she should not walk the streets at night because strange people could do strange things to her. This would be the start of a four-month-long kidnapping and sexual assault spree committed by four men. The youngest was a 17-year-old who suffered from leprosy. Seven women would be identified as victims of the group. They were caught in August of 1980 when two of them went to a restaurant where one of the victims worked and asked for her. When she spotted them, she was able to notify police who arrested them. The other two were picked up shortly after. Three of the men lived in Irvine and one of them lived in Santa Ana. Their conviction would ignite a political debate about crime and punishment when they were given 400 plus years in prison for their combined crimes of kidnapping, sexual assault, sodomy, robbery, and the use of a weapon in the commission of crimes. Had Dorothy's abduction been considered a kidnapping and properly investigated as such, she could easily have been considered a possible victim of this group. Although she was a couple of years older than most of their victims, 
and her car was taken with four assailants and a robbery as part of the motivation, this could have easily been accomplished. Although all of the locations of the abductions were not detailed in the media reports, the Costa Mesa incident was two miles south of the location Dorothy's car was burned. Another was on Harbor Boulevard near Disneyland. Custom John's, one of the head shops, was located on the corner of Harbor Boulevard and Vermont, two blocks from Disneyland. The women were taken to rural areas in Irvine and unincorporated Anaheim, according to reports. The place where Dorothy's remains were found was off of Santa Ana Canyon Road, a rural part of Anaheim Hills, which may have been described as an unincorporated part of Anaheim at the time. If initial media reports had been about the abduction of a woman in a hospital parking lot, someone may have put these incidents together. Investigators could have considered whether Dorothy had been a victim of these abductors. Dorothy may well have been a victim of this group, but they were not the only individuals sexually assaulting women in the area at the time. The very day the Orange County Register reported Dorothy's father coming to them, a small blurb and sketch appeared a couple of pages over about a sexual assaulter being sought in the city of Orange. The blurb read, Orange police are seeking the identity of a long-haired man resembling this police drawing. He is suspected of kidnapping and sexually assaulting a 15-year-old girl on her way home from junior high school Monday afternoon. It goes on to indicate the attack occurred on Glacelle near Collins, and the man was driving a white pickup truck. The blurb piqued our interest because the attack was two miles from UCI Hospital and two blocks from Chapman University, just two weeks after the abduction of Dorothy. Additionally, it was in a location that could have been traveled moving between UCI Hospital and Santa Ana Canyon Road. However, we knew the unsolved sexual assault of an unfortunate middle school girl wouldn't help in determining who killed Dorothy, unless the assailant could be identified. Exactly one year after the publication of the blurb, a woman named June was invited to sit in a man's truck and listen to music with him. After she entered the truck, she was surprised when the man started the engine and began driving. Her surprise turned into fear as she discovered the inside handle of the passenger side door was missing. The man drove to a residential area where he sexually assaulted her. As he attacked her, he began strangling her, but gasping for air, she said she couldn't breathe. When the man opened the door, June was able to escape. The man was identified and eventually convicted of the attack. He would go on to serve 19 months of a three-year sentence, being released early after becoming the victim of a sexual assault in prison. The man returned to Southern California after his release. On December 29, 1983, a woman named Antea would leave her home in Huntington Beach to get a pack of cigarettes. Her lifeless remains would be found five days later. She had been wrapped in a blanket and placed in the back of her car, which was found parked in an alley in Long Beach. Working from the matchbook they found near the car, investigators checked a restaurant in Newport Beach, where witnesses recalled seeing Antea talking to a man identified as Martin Kipp. They then learned that Kipp had recently been evicted Another tenant told police that on December 30th, he had found Kip sleeping in the closet with his clothes torn and scratches on his face. Kip had only explained by saying he had had a hard night. A check of his fingerprints on the file for Kip proved to be a match to the prints found on Antea's car. Around the same time, Kip was picked up in Laguna Hills for traffic warrants. He was then charged with sexual assault and murder. Authorities would later add the charges of sexually assaulting and murdering a college student named Tiffany. Comparing the sketch of the abductor in the orange blurb a week after Dorothy's disappearance and an image of Kip makes him a possible suspect of that attack. His method and crimes would also make him a potential suspect in the abduction and murder of Dorothy. It is unknown what became of the four men convicted of the spree of kidnappings and sexual assaults 
beyond their going to prison to serve their 400-year sentences. None of their names come up in a search of the California Inmate Database. However, Kip remains on California's death row today, distinguished as the longest resident of death row in California history. The story of Dorothy Jane Scott has been told and retold many times over the years, and from what we have heard, the focus is always on the calls she, her family, and the media receive. The crank call that Dorothy's parents received immediately after the disappearance seemed to control the trajectory of this case's lore, and ineffective investigation conducted into her disappearance seemed to have doomed justice for her family, though a perfect investigation likely would not have saved her. In our opinion, it is much more likely that Dorothy fell prey to a random predator in the parking lot of the medical center rather than of a stalker. The justice she deserved then became the second victim, falling prey to the self-interest of investigators and a poorly executed investigation. Thank you for watching. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to support the channel.